which is the formal, common, ordinary structure of a letter because it is a letter. We, we call these sections of the New Testament books, but most of them are letters, actually, and they fit a pattern. And so last week we saw the usual opening of a letter written by Paul from prison to the church in Philippi, which is in a, a Roman colony to the north of Greece. We read in Acts chapter 16 about how God started the church there, and a number of years have passed, and Paul, whom God used there to start the church, he's away, he's in prison, he writes a letter back to them, in part to tell them how he's doing, they've heard he's in jail, they know he's in prison, in part to tell them about his future plans, in, in part to, to thank them for the recent monetary gift they'd sent him, but most of all, he writes under the inspiration of God to help them to endure and to grow and really to thrive in the same sort of trying, pressing environment that he's facing. The same struggles that he's looking at, they're looking at, and he writes to help them through it. Last week in verses 1 to 2, we saw the introduction, the usual writer to the recipient, greetings. That's how the letter would begin, but he takes that usual structure and turns it and loads it up with theology. And we saw that what it becomes for us is God identifying us, God showing us who we are. We are simply servants. We are saints. And we are recipients of grace and therefore peace from God, the Father, and from the Son. We're servants, which is a great relief because it tells us that God's in charge of us and God's responsible for providing the resources and giving us the direction and planting us in the places where we are. We are simply servants of his. Not to think too highly of ourselves, but to follow him. And we are saints. We talked about this. This is a glorious truth. We are people who have been drawn out by God. The, the root of that word is, is the word holiness. We are drawn out, separated from the world, separated to him, made his people. All by the grace of God that provided a gospel and then opened our eyes to see the gospel and believe it. All the work of God. Pouring out grace on us and therefore making peace with us. So we are no longer at odds, no longer enemies with God. It's him identifying who we are, who Christians are. And now as we turn to verse 3, we come to the body of the letter, which begins again typically with, a, with giving of thanks. And again, Paul turns it from the normal to be a section of thanksgiving and really one of worship and praise. So I'm going to read verses 1 through 11 again to give us the larger perspective, but we'll be focusing on verses 3 to 8 this morning. After I read the passage, I'm going to develop... Three different observations of, of different lengths. The first one's the longest one. Three different observations from this passage that all together kind of help explain something. I'm going to summarize it here in this sentence. Here's my main point for this morning. This passage teaches us to give joyful thanks to God for his work in the church. Give joyful thanks to God for his work in the church. That's what I'll build towards here in a moment, but let me read the passage, Philippians chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer 
that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Philippians chapter 1. It's all verses 1 through 11. As I said, we'll be focusing on kind of the middle of that, 3 to 8. Develop it in three observations, and here's the first one, the longest. Joyfully thank God for his gift of gospel partners. Joyfully thank God for his gift of gospel partners. Verse 3 gives us the main verb for this whole section, I thank God. It's about thanks. Paul's focused on giving thanks, on thanksgiving here at the outset of the letter. As we work through this, we're going to look at something that he's modeling for us. He isn't expressly commanding this, but he's modeling it for us. And so as we look at this, what we'll see is this is what mature faith looks like. This is what we should be, look, should be looking like. So there's some responsibility here, simultaneously responsibility, and some privilege, which I'll come to eventually. So what Paul, a mature Christian, looks like, he is in joyful thanksgiving to God for his gift of gospel partners, that is, other Christians. He's writing to the Philippians, telling them that he frequently is thankful for them as he prays. That's what he means by this remembrance of you. That's what he says twice in verse 4 then, when he prays, when he prays. He is frequently praying, giving thanks in all my remembrance, always in every prayer for you all. Repeated emphasis. That's his general attitude, not just at the moment when he's writing this letter. He's saying, I'm like this towards you. Frequently in prayer, In every prayer of mine for you all, that is, all the saints there, all the Christians in the church. And he makes this prayer, end of verse 4, with joy. So you've got Paul, who is frequently remembering and praying always for all of them with joy. So he is frequently, prayerfully giving thanks for them, for all of them. To God. Now this should be obvious, but he's thankful for them, frequently, joyfully, consistently praying to God. Why? Because God is the one who's responsible for what it is we're going to see here. Something here delights him, and he says, that comes from you, so I thank you. I pray to you frequently. I am joyful towards you, not towards them. God is the one thanked. Why? Verse 5 because of your partnership in the gospel. Now, the word used there might get the attention of some of us here because of a particular women's ministry event that we have, a particular program, koinonia, we call it. It Happens throughout the week here. That's the word that he uses here, this partnership. Gospel koinonia, or gospel co-participation. We run, we run a risk of misunderstanding. Oftentimes, in, in our shorthand, we define quinity as fellowship. And we run a risk there of thinking that fellowship is an end in itself. His phrasing here tells us, fellowship, co-participation, partnership, gospel partnership. When Paul looks at them, he looks at these Philippian believers here and gives thanks to God. What it is that drives him to God in thankfulness and in joy consistently with great frequency and and earnestness is their partnership, their co-participation with him in the gospel. 
He's thankful that God would create gospel partners for him. It's a wonderful thing. Which means exactly what? Gospel partners. Partnership in the gospel. What are we talking about? We need to think about this because it, that's what's going to connect us to our responsibility and eventually to our, to our privilege here. Paul's showing us something here. He's thankful for people. He's thankful for people who are gospel partners with him, which begins first foundationally at the gospel. There is no partnership, there is no union, no unity apart from, separate from the gospel. It must start there. If we are gospel partners, if you are in gospel partnership with me from the first day until now, where that started at the first day was with the gospel itself when you came into the gospel with me. So we're talking about gospel partnership, but we need to be very clear that at the, at the bottom level here is the good news, is the message. That's what gospel is. It's a message, not a list of things to do. It is not instruction about what one does. The gospel is a message about what has been done. Very important clarification around here. There is a message. God in right justice looks at people. And there is a great problem. We, each of us, every single one of us, we live and we breathe in rebellion against him. A great problem because God is just. That's not the good news. The good news is about what God did to respond to the problem. God sent this great son, Jesus, sent him as a servant, as we talked about last week, that he would humble himself to be a servant, and yet even more than that, he would be humble to take on death, even more than that, death on a cross. Why a cross? Because that's where the curse of God is poured out, not on me, but on him in place of me. That is good news. God has done something to address my, your condemnation before him. Gospel. He sent his son to go to the cross to remove off of all who trust him his right wrath and replace that onto all those same ones vast love grace that we would be at peace <laughs> talked about this last week in relation to verse 2 that's the gospel and that's where it all starts and all of those in this church here Paul looks at them and says I look at you and see you as gospel partners with me from the first day, and I turn to God in consistent thanksgiving and joy because he is the one who's responsible for you even being with me in the gospel. For us being partners in this co-participants in the gospel, it is all due to him, and so I give joyful thanks consistently to him. Bless the Lord for this. And then it moves on from there. It, it starts there. It has to start there. There is no partnership apart from that beginning. But then we move on because he also looks at them and says, this partnership that we have, you and I, it, it's more than just being in the gospel together. It is a co-laboring together for the advancement of the gospel. And in verse 7, he will call them partakers with me of grace, another term for the gospel, because it is a gospel of grace both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. They are with him in the gospel and with him for the gospel. They're not in jail with him. 
but they are with him. They are materially supportive of him. He's going to thank him in chapter 4. Some even say that it's alluded to here in this very section. But chapter 4, he's going to thank them expressly for their numerous financial gifts to him in his mission work and now that he's in prison. If you look at the end of chapter 1, he knows that they are engaged in the very same conflict that he is engaged in, verse 30. That they are suffering just like he is, verse 29. They are with him for the gospel. The sharing in the work. At the base level, they are believers, and then they share with him for the spread of the gospel, for the defense of the gospel out there, but more so for the spread, for the growth of the gospel in here. They, like Paul, want to see growing in them what Paul elsewhere will call the obedience of faith. Providentially, it's come up in a couple different conversations in our church recently. It's the bookends of the book of Romans where Paul defines his mission for the obedience of faith in the nations. Very beginning of Romans, very end of Romans. That's how he summarizes it. An obedience to God that comes from faith. Faith that believes this God who has stepped towards me in the gospel to address my deepest need, to remove off of me wrath, who's given me Christ for that, will he not also along with him give me all things? Indeed, so I will believe him. When he says, you, Steve, should take this step, this direction, I will say, yes, believing his promise to do me good right there tomorrow. That's obedience by faith. That's gospel-driven obedience. That's what Paul is about. He's not just about people changing teams. You can put a name over your head, Christian. He's about bringing about the obedience of faith. That's gospel-driven obedience to God. Gospel-driven they are too, this Philippian church. They are partners with him in the gospel. Believers with him, they're Christians. They are supporters of him taking the gospel out there to the nations. They are supporters of him and co-workers with him of the gospel growing in here, in their local congregation and in each of their hearts. Partners in the gospel. Together in a work. A ministry. Okay, now the important piece to grasp right here, this is, this is not rocket science, that's what a church is supposed to be. Period. We are to be a gospel partnership. Together in the gospel, at the very base level, believing, saved ones, but not resting there, moving on for the advancement of the gospel out there, in here, and in here. In partnership with each other, one to one to one, three to three, five to five, in small groups, in slightly larger groups, the whole of us all together as an entity. It is a gospel partnership, another term for the church. There are not two different categories here of, of Christians or churches and then gospel partners. I probably should say, at least there shouldn't be. This is what the church is to be. So I, I need to, to put this in front of you and plead with you. This, I'm, I'm here for a moment pausing on this responsibility. We should think of ourselves and we should be working towards this idea of, of a partnership, a, a, 
a koinonia that is not about fellowship as an end in itself, that is not about hanging out together, partners. It's, it's a togetherness for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of the obedience of faith growing in me and growing in you. That's why we are partners, you and I, Christian. I think many of us, I I will not say all, but I think many of us will say, yes, I understand, but we do not consistently live for this. Watch how you interact with the body. I would suggest that for many of us, maybe not for you or for you all the time, but for many of us, I would suggest that our interaction with the body is vastly more frequently and more deeply oriented around how I feel about these people and if I like them or not. What brings me some enjoyment? I'm not against enjoying people. Okay? But can I point out the difference there between that, I think, very consistent driver for our fellowship and gospel partnership? Do you see the difference there? If I exist with you for the sake of the growth of the gospel in my life and in your life, that may, and I think over time, will be enjoyable for me, but the enjoyable part is not the prime driver. It's not the determining front-end factor. Do I like you, yes or no? No, then I'm out. No. A gospel partnership That's what a church is supposed to be. People together for the sake of the gospel. Starting in the gospel, for the growth of the gospel out there, in here, and in here. Now, a lot to be said about how that happens and how we grow in that, but that's not the point for this morning. Paul's response, as he looks at a church, that's what gives him this consistent delight and joyful thanksgiving and prayer. I look at them and I see, oh, these are people who with me are partners in the gospel. Bless your name, Lord, because you are the one who made that. That is not normal. That is not how people of the flesh are. That is sign of grace right there, that you made these people, that you made a church, that you bound them together, and they with me are about the gospel. Bless God for that. So our responsibility here on the the front end, first, our responsibility is to say we should be that kind of people and we should bless God for those kinds of people because that is where it comes from. He is where that comes from. He makes it. May He make it more in us. So, joyfully thank God for his gift of other Christians partnered in the gospel. That's a responsibility. And to ask him then to grow in us that kind of an attitude, that kind of a heart, it's a responsibility. And I say our privilege. And as soon as I say privilege, I think a rather obvious obstacle appears because it is all well and good for Paul, the Apostle Paul, to pray in consistent thanksgiving and enjoy because this model Philippian church in the Bible are partners with him in the gospel. That's all well and good. 
but I live with these people. Right? And you live with me. Neither one of us is an apostle, and we aren't the Philippians. It hardly seems like this is a gift to me. I was just saying that we very, very rarely, I fear, live with the gospel at the center of our communion. So you tell me, give thanks to the Lord joyfully over this partnership in the gospel, but then I open my eyes and I say, this. What do we do with that? You call that a privilege. How's that? Well, let me explain that by moving to the second point. Second observation. Thank God. Give thanks to God. Thank God. Seeing His faithfulness to finish His sanctifying work. Thank God, seeing his faithfulness to finish his sanctifying work. Come to verse 6, which really is a continuation of thought in this one long sentence. So depending what English translation you look at, it, it may not actually be printed as a separate sentence because it isn't actually a separate sentence. It's continuing on, connected to the main verb, thank, So follow the line of thought. I thank my God, verse 5, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day till now, being sure of this. Thank my God for you being sure of this. This is an important point for us as we look around at those people who are our partners. I thank my God for you, sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. Paul's giving thanks to God for what he sees because he knows that God began it. And he gives thanks knowing that God is going to continue it and carry it on all the way to the end to perfection. Those who are in the gospel with you, with you right now, here, us in the church. If you think for just a minute, you look at those people and you say, God has done something. God has begun something there. Indeed. And God will carry it along and continue it until it reaches its end point. What it's referring to is the opposite of what we talked about last week in the verse 1, to all the saints in Christ Jesus. We emphasized last week that that's a, that's a status. Those are folks who have been drawn out, all these Christians drawn out from the world and have a status, a standing, set-apart ones. And I mentioned last week, That is certainly true. That has dramatic effect on how it is we walk through life now, increasingly set apart, increasingly holy. That's what he's getting at here. There is a work that has been begun, and God will carry it all the way through. He's emphasizing a continuing work that I will certainly carry, I will hold, I will make sure that it gets all the way to the end, to completion, the day of Christ. He's committed to it. It will happen. At the end, at the day when Christ returns to claim his people, kind of got to get your mind there for a second. At the end, Christ will come and will claim all of his people. He will be revealed, and every eye will see him, and 
every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Christ is Lord. And all of his people joyfully, wonderfully will be changed in a twinkling of an eye in a moment. Made new. He will finish the work. He began it now. It's not done. Certainly not done. And if that's all you look at, just the work begun now but not done, if that's all you look at, it is very easy then to fall into this view of seeing, man, these folks right here, these people who God has drawn around me and put in fellowship with me, in partnership with me, I want a new team. I want to be traded. Because this group of people, I know this one's problems and that one's shortcomings and this one's lunacy and this one's on and on. It is easy. And those things are the ones that, that stuff draws your attention. Yes, indeed, here in the gospel with me, a work begun, you must see more. You must lift up your eyes and see he is about something, certainly about carrying a work all the way through to the end. And one day when he comes, you will be stunned by what the person sitting next to you is. Assuming that person's a Christian. A fully reflecting image bearer of God. The glory of the Lord fully seen in this person's face. You're sitting next to someone of tremendously glorious magnitude. Veiled now in all kinds of failings. And if that's all you see, it will be very difficult to joyfully, consistently, prayerfully give thanks that you made this one. You must see more. You must give thanks, sure of the fact that he will carry out his work of finishing their change. You have to see that. It's true. That's what drives Paul's thanksgiving here. Sure of this, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion the day of Christ. That, first, in the context, it immediately is talking about how it is that I, as, as a prayer, prayer as Paul in Paul's shoes, how I could be thankful for, for this one, this partnership. You must see more and see the certainty of change. Who despises a baby for going to the bathroom in his pants? Who? They're supposed to. And you know full well they won't forever. Now we in our sin, sure, we get messed up about that. But we also know that's sin, and we're not supposed to get messed up about that. We call each other down off the cliff. Yeah, it's a messy diaper. Yeah, it's a blowout into the, into the onesie. Sure, yeah, come back. We'll wash it. What holds you together there and still enables you to change the diaper and look at this one as beautiful and wonderful is the full understanding that this is growth. That there's something at work to change this one and this one's becoming more. you got to see that about each other. But it's perhaps worth taking a slight detour. You've got to see that about yourself, Christian. You're a Christian. You're in the gospel, and a whole bunch of us are very aware of our dirty diapers. You're very aware of your shortcomings, of your failings, of your wickedness. You can put that word on some of the stuff that's in your mind about you right now. You're aware of it. Maybe nobody else is. 
And sometimes you're, you're in a panic trying to cover it up, but there are other times when you're just crushed by it. Because you know you shouldn't be like that, and you don't want to be like that. And you look at yourself right now and you say, Ah, I am. I'm dirty. So verse 6. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. He is at work in you. He remains at work in you. He is changing you. And one day you will stand in glory before him. Pure, spotless bride. That's what Christ is about with his people. You are already a saint last week. And in the process of being cleaned up, you have a wonderful, sanctifying husband who is powerful, who is gracious and loving and is committed. He wipes you clean and will carry you all the way to the end. Finally, one day you will stand glorified. Who you are right now is not who you're going to be. It is good and right for you to want to be more. If you want to talk about some things specifically, by all means, pursue an elder, pursue a pastor. But you, maybe you need to hear, God is at work in you. That's a really good thing. And he continues at work in you, even in the moments when you feel like you're falling behind, when you feel like you're sliding backwards. Even in those moments, sometimes those are in particular the moments when God's doing a a unique work, that he's removing the things that you have relied on previously, or he's turning you away from stuff that you thought worked but wasn't him. And he's turning you back towards the gospel, back towards faith in him that will lead to obedience. Even sometimes in the darkest moments, those are the best. He's at work in you, and he will carry it all the way to completion. That's you personally. As I said, in the context that sits in this position of explaining how it is that Paul can look at real people and be thankful to God consistently in joy for their partnership with him. Because he knows you've begun something and you're working out whatever's wrong and you're carrying it all the way to the end. And there's our privilege. You don't have to be traded to another team to enjoy this partnership of the gospel. The partnership of the gospel doesn't need to shape up, get fixed, improve, or grow before you can be thankful and joy for it. The privilege is that you can actually live verse 3 and verse 4 with these ones right now, and I can live that with you right now. even though we're all in process and we're not done and there's something drastically wrong with us. Indeed, there is. But we are thankful looking at this great gospel partnership that we are together about the gospel and we are thankful knowing certain of the fact that he has begun a work and he is the one who carries it through and will complete it. So I can be thankful for and about you. I can rejoice over you even and you over me. That is a great privilege. What that means is that what he actually has delivered to you in this church, in this fellowship, you don't have to go somewhere else, in this one, 
with these people, what he has delivered to you is something precious, a communion of saints, a people, a fellowship. You have a home, you have a family, warts and all. What a privilege you have. And you can look at these ones and you can give thanks for them joyfully, seeing God's work, seeing God's continuing work, and seeing his sure work at the end. It is right for you to feel this way about these ones. And that's what takes us to the third point. Lastly, joyful thanksgiving flows from the affection of Christ. Thanksgiving that is joyful and that is frequent, prayerful. Thanksgiving to God flows from the affection of Christ. Verse 7 says, It is right for me to feel this way about you all, which is not a direct reference to only what was immediately before. He's kind of capturing everything there. It's appropriate that I be moved to regular joyful thanksgiving about your partnership with me and your sure sanctification because... It's right for me to say this about you because I have you in my heart, you gospel partners, you. Verse 8, oh, how I long for you all, oh, so deeply with the affection of Christ. It's appropriate for me to feel this way because I hold you in my heart. There's affection, language of affection. It's the affection of Christ, he says at the end of verse 8. So joyful thanksgiving flows from the affection of Christ. One leads to the other. Follow that. And if you think about that, this is expressed right here, and you step away from the Bible, you say, actually, that's how all thanksgiving works. You think about something for which you are thankful, Genuine thanksgiving and, and praise of something always flows where there is actual affection or delight or pleasure. You can say you're thankful for something, for the worst of all gifts even, just be polite. But if it's going to be genuine thanksgiving, if it's going to be a genuine joyful thank you that's wonderful, that only comes from if in here you actually like it. If there's pleasure somehow connected to this thing. Paul has affection here. I hold you in my heart. The language of emotion. I yearn for you with affection. The passion of Christ. This is the key and it comes here finally at the end. This long train of thought about Paul giving thanks for these people because of what he sees in them and what he sees God doing in them, it comes all the way down at the very end to, I have an affection in my heart for them. The affection of Christ. Fundamentally, he loves them like Christ does. So here we are, charged by example to give thanks to God for the people who admittedly are imperfect, but they are our partners. They are with us here. And at the very end, what Paul says is, I love you. I have the affection of Christ for you. And if you're like me, right at that point, I get a little frustrated. 
I first of all, me personally, I first of all, I say this not just because it's important to know about me, it's not. I say this because I think a lot of us live here. I first of all, don't really deal well with the language of love, affection. I particularly then find it challenging to love people that I find unlovely. Do you? By definition. And then, thirdly, a lot of people that I'm close to, and again, I'm saying I because it, I don't want to be so direct as to say you, but that's what I mean. <laughs> right? Right? Thirdly, then, I find that a whole lot of people, the more I get to know them, the more I find them to be unlovely. And so then, finally, I, I listen to all of this here, and I see Paul, and maybe, okay, maybe I'm persuaded by the, okay, I can, I can give thanks for these people for the gospel work that God has done in them and is doing in them and will carry to completion. Maybe I'm persuaded by that, but that's kind of up here. I really don't love you yet. Is it just me? That's all like a persuasion of, of, a, of an argument. I see how that's put together. But I really don't actually have an affection for you yet. I really don't have you in my heart yet. Some of you I do. But not, not many. That makes it difficult to, to track the argument. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all. It's interesting how many times he says for you all. Four times if I count it properly. Throughout the passage, he talks about all of them. Some people who were probably his best friends, but some people he's never met. If we're, think about this. He hasn't been there in years. He has no idea who's going to be in the pew when this letter's read. I love you all. Pray for you all the time. Thankful in joy for you. I am not there. And by I, I mean you. At the end, what this comes down to, Paul can so boldly say, God is my witness. God who knows the heart knows this is the truth about me. How I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ. Where in the world does that come from? Not from me. Where does the affection of Christ come from? That's, that's the key to the whole thing, that he actually loves them. God is his witness. God would say, yep, he does. He actually yearns for these people. Where does that come from? Where do you think it comes from? Is it in you? No. For certain ones, sometimes the people that we're married to, sometimes our bestest friends, but not six rows over, three seats back, not that person. Where does that come from? Thanks be to God that he can, does, and is committed to the process of finally, fully creating in us what is right and appropriate, but not there yet. Paul's saying, Christ loves you like this. I too, says Paul, love you like this. I think we probably should acknowledge that both God and Paul know that Paul's still a sinner and so doesn't love perfectly. 
but he's experienced something. Christ loves you like this. Paul says, I love you like this. Christ gives to Paul his very heart. Christ dwells in Paul so richly, so deeply, so widely that what comes out of Paul is an affection for the people of God that is Christ-like. It is the sign of Christian maturity to love the people of God like Christ does. What matters in the end? Faith working itself in love. I, t- I talk about love for people and I am way over my head. But I have to put this in front of you. This, this is... This is what's needed in in a people, in a body, that there would be Christ-like eyes to see and Christ-like heart to love. And it is so foreign to us. It is so other. It is so supernatural. Where we are left at the end is to cry out to God to make us that. To give us eyes to see and a heart to feel. In other words, would you come and so deeply indwell me so as to control me and change me? In other words, Spirit of God produce in me the fruit of love. And joy and peace and patience and kindness, etc. That comes from God. And we must turn back to God and cry out that He would give it to us. That we would live with and respond to this people here like we should. I am so far from it. I think that many people who get a feel of our body, who get some, some touch of it, would say that we, that we are gracious and kind on the outside, but lack something in the center. I think... So people of God, my partners here in the gospel, is the gospel driving deeply into you so as to change you and to produce in you fruit of love? If not, cry out to God for more. Paul shows us here what mature Christianity looks like. It is a thankfulness to God, joyfully so, as he looks at partners in the gospel. May God build in us that same joyful thanksgiving by building us to be lovers Lovers of him, lovers of others. That is a work of God. And I do not mean to contradict myself when I say that is a work of God, but what can you do? Because you have something that you can do. We love because who can fill it in? He first loved us. Our love to him is a response to his love to us. One thing that you can do, Christian brother, Christian sister, is to reflect on what God has done to love you. What God has done to love that other person out there. And ask Him to grow in you, matching returned affection. To love Him as He loves you. And as you love Him, you'll love what He loves. That is a work of God. But you have something to do there. Embrace that. Consider his love for you. Bathe your mind 
in all of the good grace that God has poured on you and ask him to shape your heart to be like his, to love with the affection of Christ. Give thanks to God for what he has formed here, a church, a partnership. We give thanks to God that he is continuing that all the way on to the end. We give thanks to God that we are free to enjoy these people, but we acknowledge that we don't enjoy them enough and we ask him to grow in us love. So let's pray along those lines now as we move towards communion. Let's pray, and then I'll close this here in a moment. Pray silently, and I'll close this in a moment. Father, I do ask you to grow in us eyes to see your people like you do. Eyes to see your great love for us. Eyes to see the gospel that saved us. So I ask you to make us a people who are centered on the gospel, who are about the gospel, who are with each other in that work who are thankful and rejoicing. Who are people like you. We need you to make us like that. So please do. Continue to meet with us. Continue to turn our minds to reflect on what you've done as we look at this cup and this bread. As we remember the communion that you have made with us and us of us, made us a people. We take it together. We remember that, Lord, cause to rise in us thankful joy the brothers and sisters here by your decision. Thank you, Lord, for the church, for the gospel. Thank you for Christ, Father. We say thank you and pray that we would treasure him more and more by your gracious help. In his name we pray. Amen.